Um, my name is Erin Riley. I am the staff scientist for the James River Association and uh, welcome to our webinar today. This is the second webinar in our State of the James series. Um, and it sort of sprang from the idea that a lot of times what we end up using or saying to sort of justify why a score has gone up or down has a lot to do with climate and how climate change impacts our um, report. So we wanted to do a webinar to essentially try to talk to you all about what potentially we are in for for climate change, as well as um, what, how that might impact the indicators that we use in our State of the James report. Um, so welcome. Um, I'm going to be talking about parts of it and uh, my coworker, Jamie Brunkow, who is the James River Association uh, advocacy manager and river keeper is also going to be talking. Um, and we, I just want to preface this with a great big shout out and thank you to all of the people who have helped us make this um, presentation. Neither Jamie nor I are actual climate scientists but we do a lot of reading of reports that climate scientists write. Um, and so if you are one of those people who write those reports, thank you. We do actually read them and there are people out there that, that do read them. Um, and we've used the information um, for this. So we're gonna start out with a basic intro into the State of the James report, what it means and sort of what some of the indicators are. Then we're going to pick out um, three things that are related to sea level rise that we think that you all might be interested in, uh, in, related to climate change that we think you all might be interested in. So the first one is sea level rise, the second one is heat, and then the last one is precipitation. Um, and when we go through these, we're going to try to talk to you about what it might mean, what the trends are predicted to be for the James River watershed, what that might mean for people and infrastructure in your neighborhood, but then also the, the river and the watershed at large. Um, and then the last thing we're going to try to talk about is what you can do. Um, we're also going, we're using a lot of different tools and resources from other people. So um, after the webinar, we have a list of sort of reports and places where you can get more information because we could probably do an hour long webinar about each of these different topics. Um, so if you want more information, we're gonna be sending it out um, following the webinar. Thanks, Aaron. So uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Jamie Bronchio. I'm the Senior Advocacy Manager and James River Keeper with the James River Association. Thank you all for being here tonight. So we're talking about climate change, but when you're approaching an issue as big and as broad as climate change, it's important to, to break it down into bite-sized chunks and to have a lens um, with which you're really viewing those issues. Uh, tonight, our lens is the State of the James Report. Like Aaron mentioned, we're gonna be releasing our uh, 2021 State of the James Report uh, this October. This comes out every two years. And um, it's very uh, typical that precipitation um, climate factors are big drivers for why different indicators either go up or go down. And um, as we get further along in, in facing some of these uh, real um, impacts from climate change, um, and those are again, um, heat, sea level rise and precipitation that we're talking about this evening, um, we know that those are gonna affect some of these indicators in, in specific ways. And in, in other ways, those three forces are gonna work together to actually cause varying effects on our indicators. And it's actually quite complex. We're gonna to try to make it simpler tonight in talking about these, these different pieces. And uh, before we get into those, I wanna give you a sense of what the State of the James is all about. So we've, we've released this report for well over a decade. And um, a lot of ways, it's a way that we measure progress at James River Association. It's, way, it's the way we measure the health of the river, but also how we're doing as a state and implementing practices to improve water quality. And um, there's a lot of detail that you can, you can read more about. If you go to stateofthejames.org, you can check out the 2019 report and see um, um, all, all, all of what we reported on two years ago. Um, it, it'll provide a good frame to help you prepare for what's coming next. Um, go ahead and, and skip to the next slide. Um, these are the, the four main pieces though. We look at fish and wildlife, for example, American shad, 
um, bald eagles, striped bass, oysters. Um, we look at habitat that includes underwater grasses, um, riparian uh, forests, things like that. Um, we look at pollution reductions, and specifically we look at nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, as well as bacteria. These are things that um, wash off of um, our cities, our farms, um, from our industries and wastewater treatment plants. And, um, and, and these all kind of feed into one another because the fourth category, protection and restoration actions, those are the things that we're doing on the landscape to really make a difference and improve water quality. Um, and this is all tied to this thing called the Chesapeake Bay cleanup plan. The James River drains to the Chesapeake Bay. And since 2010, we've been um, a part of this huge effort across the entire Chesapeake Bay from New York down to Virginia to implement practices and to restore um, the, the James River and all of the rivers that drain into the Chesapeake Bay. So that might mean uh, planting more trees, installing more living shorelines and coastal areas, um, using conservation practices on farms like uh, no-till or fencing cows out of creeks and, um, and, and other options as well, cover crops. Um, we, we largely know what needs to be done to improve water quality. Um, and it's really a matter of getting those practices on the ground. Um, now enter climate change, right? So we'll talk more about sort of those other factors, the things that are, that are really driving changes outside of our actions. Um, well, looking at river health, we actually saw a decline in the 2019 report and you can probably guess um, 2018 was a really wet year. It was a record wet year in many places, um, including in Virginia. And as a result, we saw more runoff, more pollution going into the river and that, that impacted river health. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. However, the other side of the coin is looking at again, the practices that we're putting on the ground, um, the, the agricultural cost share programs, the, the upgrades to wastewater treatment plants, um, stormwater infrastructure, making our cities more absorbent and able to absorb stormwater runoff. Um, those things have been actually on the increase. We've been doing more of those things. And so go ahead and go to the, the next slide. When we average our river restoration progress and our river health, um, we, we held even um, between 2017 and 2019 at a 60%. So um, the key takeaways there are we are making a lot of progress over the long term. Um, the James is arguably one of the most improved rivers in the Chesapeake Bay, especially for those who might remember um, those days of uh, the Keypone spill and um, you know, sewage in the river um, prior to wastewater treatment technologies really coming on board. The James has seen tremendous improvement, but we are having to grapple with um, things like really intense precipitation and other effects from climate change. So go ahead and go to the next slide. I go ahead and skip to the next slide, Aaron. It's James. Did it not work? Yes, sorry about that folks, just had a delay in the signal. So thinking about the state of the James, thinking about the progress that we've, we've um, made and the challenges we have ahead of us to, to fully restore the health of the river, we have to consider climate change. We have to think about how um, this is gonna affect um, fish and wildlife, um, habitat, um, the, the pollution reductions that we're trying to achieve. And um, a very timely report um, was released um, uh, in June of 2021 and um, has gotten some attention in the media recently. Um, this is from the Virginia Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine, a report written for members of the General Assembly. And um, I'll just read this because it's, I think, very important to acknowledge climate change will have an increasingly disruptive effect on people living in Virginia's coastal areas during the 21st century. And these disruptions will have repercussions across the Commonwealth. So we are um, on the precipice of more increased impacts um, associated with climate change. We're already seeing some of these things happen. And it's something that we really have to keep at the forefront as we're planning to um, uh, really adapt to these circumstances and continue to um, make improvements in the health of the river. Um, so these are graphics from the Climate Central um, website, which Climate Central is a group of journalists and scientists that um, work together to produce um, data-driven uh, images that can help people sort of understand things related to climate. And so um, one of the great things that they have put out is kind of this hazard intensity um, for 
four of the different cities in our um, in our watershed. And so when you're looking at the, the results, I think one thing that kind of stands out is that across our watershed, people are gonna be seeing and being impacted by different climate hazards. So in Norfolk and Richmond, the number one water hazard you're gonna see is sea level rise. Um, as you get further up the watershed, you're no longer in tidal areas, that becomes less of a problem and precipitation becomes the main climate hazard that you're gonna see. So looking at these results and sort of talking with each other, this is how we came out with, we wanna talk about sea level rise, we wanna talk about heat, and we wanna talk about precipitation because these are the main um, climate hazards that are gonna be facing our region. Um, so to start with about sea level rise. So the first thing I wanna talk about is what is sea level rise? And if you start to get deep into any of the, um, literature and tools and discussion about sea level rise, you'll hear a lot of terms like sea level rise, relative sea level rise, high tide flooding, sunny day flooding, blue sky flooding, uh, king tides, spring tides. And so I wanted to clarify sort of what all of these different things mean. So the first one is sea level rise. And this is um, essentially when you're talking about on the global scale, um, sea level is going is rising across the globe, and that's because as water gets warmer, it expands, as well as as we have the um, melting of a lot of the glaciers and snow deposits, um, ice sheets in Antarctica and in the Arctic, um, we're getting more water, and that water is taking up more space. And so that, when you talk about sea level rise, it's sort of the global phenomenon. How that impacts every place is what we were talking about when we talk about relative sea level rise. Now, there are other parts um, that go into the, the relative sea level rise rate that you're gonna see. So things like um, local subsidence because of groundwater withdrawals or things like how far away from the glaciers you are um, can impact your relative sea level rise. Um, so most of the time when people are talking about like local sea level rise, they're, they're talking about this relative sea level rise. Uh, high tide flooding, sunny day flooding, and blue sky flooding, they're pretty much all the same. These are flooding on days when you wouldn't necessarily expect to have flooding. So it's just when you have like a really high tide or the wind is just blowing in the right direction and you have flooding on your streets, but there's no storm, there's no storm surge. There's, it's just a regular old day that just happens to be flooding. Um, king tides and spring tides um, are sort of the same thing. Some people use the terms interchangeably, but they have to do with our, a higher, high, higher than normal high tide because of the way that the sun and the moon line up when you get your tides. Um, and so those are gonna be, these, these king tides and spring tides are gonna often be the days when you see sunny day flooding or high tide flooding or, or blue sky flooding. But you can have all of those on days that aren't spring tides as well. So um, what does sea level rise look like in the James watershed? So this is sort of a, a conceptual diagram of a shoreline. And so in our area, we have a lot of um, salt marshes that, um, or at least we used to have a lot of salt marshes. And what happens is you have this mean high water level. So that's like your regular high tide. And then you'll have this, this black line here, which is gonna be your storm surge. So when you have sea level rise, your high tide becomes higher. Um, so you have a new mean higher, mean higher high water or mean high tide, mean at typical high tide. And that means also that if you have a storm or something like that, you're gonna have higher storm surge as well. Um, so this has a lot of implications for um, things like wetlands and forests that are along the shoreline, as well as people's neighborhoods. Um, so what's predicted to happen? Um, in our area, we are a sea level rise hotspot. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for that, but um, we are expected to see approximately two feet of sea level rise by 2100 under a very sort of conservative um, emissions scenario. So Virginia has decided that the intermediate high scenario is the scenario we're gonna go with, um, but this mid-level emission scenario is, is more conservative than that. Um, and so part of this is these days where you have this sunny day flooding is another way that we measure this. 
And so over the past 50 years, we've seen an increase of um, the number of days where, where you see high tide flooding. Um, and this is seen all over the Chesapeake Bay, but Norfolk is in particular susceptible. And it's also a point where we have um, a long record of, of water levels and of sea level rise. And so if you look at just the historic sea level rise rate at um, the, the tide gauge in Norfolk, we're all, we've already been seeing from uh, like the 1930s till now, we have a sea level rise rate of about five millimeters a year. Now that is a historic rate and because we have such a long, um, lo a long record, it, it's sort of tempered out by the earlier ones. And what we're seeing is that there's sort of an exponential increase in the sea level rise rate. So what does that look like in your neighborhood? So this is um, a photo from a story map that the University of Virginia put out about flooding in um, Norfolk. And this is a neighborhood in The Hague, which is one of the neighborhoods that is especially susceptible. Um, and this is just from a, a, a day where it was flooding. And so these different lines here on the, the right side photo you, that you can see, they line up with the historic levels of sea level rise, um, the low scenario sea level rise, medium scenario sea level rise, and high scenario sea level rise. And actually, they've created this tool where you can put in your address if you live in Norfolk and um, see what it would look like on your house. But what does that really mean? So in Norfolk, there's actually a church. This is kind of like a famous story. There's a church in Norfolk that frequently, whenever they would have events, they it was too flooded to actually get to the church. And so the church itself has actually had to move to Virginia Beach um, because the congregation couldn't get into the church on, on these days when it was just high tide flooding. It wasn't big storms. It was just, it was a high tide and people couldn't get to church. And so there's things like that, but it's also not just things like church. It's also, can garbage trucks get into these neighborhoods? Can um, people get into these neighborhoods? Can people who are in these neighborhoods get to the hospital if they need to get to the hospital? Things like that that um, we're really trying to, to look at and, and sort of think about when we're talking about sea level rise. And so when we're looking at kind of the larger watershed, what does that necessarily mean? So this is from the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer, and it's a land use map. So on the left side, we have what's currently the land use, and you can see this like bright fuchsia color. Um, this is a section of the Chickahominy River, uh, right where it meets the James is at the very bottom of the screen. Um, and so you can see in this bright fuchsia color, that's what we call freshwater emergent wetland. So this is a freshwater wetland. And with just one foot of sea level, um, one of the things I think is really interesting, and we're definitely going to get one foot of sea level, like that is not a question, but um, a lot of this area converts to um, saltwater marsh. And so this area at the Chickahominy is sort of at the area where the, the freshwater saltwater um, line meets. And as we have sea level rise, that area is gonna sort of move further upstream. And what you're gonna have is areas that were fresh are gonna become salty. Um, and so that's what we see in this scenario here where we have one foot of sea level rise. And then you also see this growing area of dark blue, which is gonna be water and then um, sort of sea blue or, or bright teal, um, that that's going to be sort of what they call unconsolidated materials. So that's like going to be mudflats or really, really waterlogged marsh or dying marsh is probably more like what it's going to be. And so what happens is the marsh will actually move back in the watershed and that forms these things called ghost forests. Um, so this, this is uh, photos from the York River, not from the James River. Um, but you can see all of these dying um, trees and the, the image on the left. So what's happened is that these, uh, these trees are now inundated more frequently. So it used to be that this was the higher elevation area. These trees were surviving, they were thriving. We had this great, I think it's probably a cedar forest. And then as sea level rose, 
these trees were inundated more and more frequently. And so what happens is the trees start to die off and you have the marsh moving into the area. So you can see sort of from, as you zoom in, um, you can see all of the dead trees with the live trees behind them. And then as you get even closer in to where we have these boardwalks on the right side, you can see that the areas with the dead trees are starting to convert to marsh. And so this is what's called uh, marsh transgression. The problem is when you run up against a road or something behind the trees, you're gonna start losing forest area as you're gaining marsh or the marsh can't migrate anymore. So we're gonna end up having some um, issues there with, with kind of area of wetlands and, and if they're able to move or not. Um, so how is sea level rise gonna show up in, the, in our state of the James indicators? Well, one of the indicators that's gonna benefit from this is oysters. Oyster, oysters need a salty environment and as the salt ledge will move up the watershed, they're gonna have more habitat that they can actually colonize. So this is gonna be good for them. Um, but areas where we might see some, some problems with, with uh, sea level rise, it's gonna be our riparian buffers because if they're right along the edge of that shoreline, they're gonna be inundated more frequently and, that, um, and face higher rates of erosion and that could cause some problems for them. So it's gonna be a mixed bag, um, and, and, but this is what we're, the areas that we think that we're gonna have impacts in. All right, um, and actually, Aaron, do you want to share a little anecdote about this photo before I jump into things? So this is a photo from Swift Creek Reservoir, um, and there was actually a, a drought, a pretty major drought in Swift Creek, and it dried up a good portion of the reservoir. So you can see all of these boats are just sitting on dry land. They're not actually in the water anymore. Um, and so we figured this would be a good photo to sort of illustrate what could happen in with high levels of heat and, and drought. Yeah, and I think it also kind of goes to the, the point you made earlier um, that the effects really vary by location around the state. Um, it's not, um, we don't necessarily expect the same thing everywhere. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, okay, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So, um, boy, does it feel hot outside to you, to you folks? Um, it is getting hotter. It's not just you. There is and increasingly, um, um, there's increasing awareness of, of exactly how much hotter it's getting. And uh, NOAA released a, a really helpful um, summary of some data um, earlier um, uh, from 2020 and uh, some notable things here. So Virginia um, annual average temperature has increased by 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, across the entire United States, 2020 was the fifth warmest in terms of average temperature in 126 years. And um, five of those warmest years have been since um, 2012. And I think this map, map really helps to show that this is really um, something that we're, we're feeling in, in different parts all across the country. But in particular, we have some impacts here in Virginia as well. Go ahead, go to the next slide. Um, one more. So, um, you know, I, I have this like childhood memory. I think I don't remember who taught me this, but sitting um, in a being in a space where there was an enormous parking lot, you know, a blacktop pavement, and looking up and seeing uh, vultures soaring on those warm air columns, basically that were you know the sun's hitting the pavement. It's um, getting really hot. It's warming the air. Those that warm air is going to rise. And that's actually helpful for um, for vultures and, and you know birds of prey that are trying to get up and and um, you know maybe look for food. Um, that's really cool, right? Well, there's other effects though. So heat island effect. That's like a real thing that has real effects in our urban environments. And this this uh, map you may have seen before. It was in the New York Times, and um, it, it's a pro it's the result of a really cool project um, that, that happened all around the country. And actually there was a, a re revisiting of this project earlier this year. Um, we can thank, um, some, some local scientists, including, uh, Jeremy Hoffman from the science museum for their part and, uh, and making this, this kind of work happen, but it, it illustrates something really interesting to me. And that's that we have, um, really vast differences in different parts of the city as far as the temperature that you're actually going to feel on a given day. And so this, this really shows that difference those areas where we have a lot of pavement, a lot of development, 
um, not a lot of trees, um, it's going to be hotter. And that's going to affect people locally. It's going to affect how it feels to you. Um, it may actually even result in um, uh, you know, uh, health impacts to a lot of people who are living in these neighborhoods over a longer period of time. So this is a long-term chronic problem, sort of um, going back to how we've built our cities or how we've not built them, um, depending on how you look at it. And, um, and it's something that's exacerbated by the effects of climate change. So we can't blame climate change on our failure to put trees and, um, and to, to really think about how we, we um, manage heat in the city. But um, this is what we have. And with warming temperatures as a result of climate change, these effects are really exacerbated. Um, you know, there's, there's good news here in that we, we do know how to address um, a lot of these issues. And there's actually a lot of great work happening already in the city of Richmond, thanks to a lot of great organizations that are dedicated to uh, planting trees, installing what we call a green infrastructure. Um, rather than having a solid piece of pavement um, in a strip mall or in a, in a developed um, suburban or urban area, having places for the rainwater to, to seep into the soil, to be um, pulled up by uh, trees and vegetation, um, that's going to reduce the amount of storm water that goes down the storm drain and ultimately carries polluted runoff with it into the river. But it also has a really helpful cooling effect. And it's also just kind of in our genetics, I think. You know, we have this, this, um, this program at James River Association called Nature RX, led by our, um, our, our uh, senior restoration uh, program manager. And it's all about um, just, just being in nature. And um, there is something, you know, ingrained, I think, in people and wanting to be in forests and wanting to be in places that are, that are natural, that are green. Um, and all of these things, fortunately, work together. Um, you know, trees are not going to um, necessarily stop the warming trend, but th these are really important tools to buffer those local effects on people, um, on nature, um, on water quality. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, I thought this headline was very interesting um, to kind of sum up the, the changes we're seeing, but um, following on the, the example that Aaron just went through, how, how does heat how, does the, how do these effects look for the James? And, um, and then I'll get to some of our indicators in just a moment. Um, well, it's getting warmer earlier. Um, so that means a, um, an earlier spring, um, a, lo a longer growing season and fewer days of frost. Um, so those who really like the heat, maybe that sounds great to you, but this has real impacts on wildlife and on the ecology and ecosystem um, of the James River. So we're really talking about a shift and what kinds of fish and shellfish and species are really favored by these conditions. Um, to put it into perspective, so here are the second bullet, um, the, the typical beginning of spring when we reach 15 degrees Celsius um, has, has been happening roughly three weeks earlier um, compared to the 1960s. And that's something that's gonna really affect um, our migratory fish, our American shad, our river herring, um, our, our sturgeon, Temperature is often a, a trigger factor for them and when they decide to move up river and to spawn. And with other fish, it may be a factor as far as whether they, they come in, into the bay and into the river at all. So over the long term, we will see gradual shifts in the range of certain fish and shellfish and, and other um, wildlife. Um, this, this headline from the uh, Virginia pilot is, a, is another really timely example where we're actually seeing um, shrimp um, further north um, in Virginia waters than we, we typically are used to seeing. And our uh, state wildlife agency that manages the fishery, the, the Marine Resources Commission, is, is looking at um, opening up more of a commercial harvest for this. So that's, that's a direct result of, of temperature shifts and, um, and, and again, shifts in the range of these key species. So um, heat also has direct impacts on water quality. It's not always all negative, but warmer water can hold less oxygen. Um, when we have um, warmer water, we can also sometimes have more algae, more algae blooms. And we've had examples also in the headlines in recent years of um, uh, harmful algal blooms, things like dinoflagellates and um, cyanobacteria. Uh, these are things that can, um, that, that are the result of warm water and an abundance of nutrients in the water, which they, they grow off of. But they also cloud the water, and they have negative impacts on other things like underwater grasses. If there's not if there's not um, light able to penetrate through the water column and reach things like grasses growing on the bottom of the river, um, that algae can have a really negative impact on on those um, species. Um, next slide, Aaron. So um, here are three examples that I wanted to just 
uh, elevate. So, uh, you know, I mentioned some of these already underwater grasses. So there's actually a, a important threshold with, at which we see um, much more impacted um, uh, eelgrass beds. So these are, you know, one of the prevalent species of uh, underwater grasses that we'll find in the bay and as well as in the lower James and places like Hampton, Newport News. Um, and it's as simple as that, that temperature shift um, negatively impacting uh, eelgrass and their ability to really thrive. We need eelgrass. We need underwater grass beds. These are plants that create oxygen. They create habitat for things like crabs and, and lots of fish that we may like to, to catch um, recreationally or commercially. Um, and so they're nursery grounds and they are important buffers in themselves to improve water quality. So if we start to lose eelgrass beds, that is a, a very negative impact on the health of the river. Um, thinking more about upstream, places like in the headwaters of the James River, um, in the mountains and those cold water streams. Uh, brook trout, um, our native uh, trout species, they, they are particularly sensitive and um, that includes to, to the warming water, to the lower dissolved oxygen that we would expect with warming water as well as pollution, um, algae blooms, and such as well. Um, these are um, the proverbial canary in the coal mine, already impacted from land development, land use changes, runoff from pollution. Um, brook trout are already a very sensitive species that, um, that we're trying um, to, to restore in a lot of those headwater streams. And climate change and warming water is a, um, is a particularly concerning issue for brook trout. And then again, um, uh, cyanobacteria, um, Alexandrium, uh, dinoflagellate species that has been showing up um, in, in some of the more brackish portions of the river. These are harmful algal species that can, um, that can make people sick, that can, that can affect wildlife in high concentrations. And as we see warmer water, higher CO2 concentrations, that's going to promote conditions for um, algae to really thrive and, and cause some negative consequences in the river. Next slide. And I'll hand it back to you, Erin. All right. Um, so this is a photo from High Bridge in um, the Appomattox. And I happened to be there um, on a day where the river was very flooded. So if you look, you can sort of see the, this is a, there's, this is a road here. Um, you can see the 25 mile an hour speed limit sign and you can see the, the double yellow line in a few places. Um, but so, so this is flooding and flooding doesn't just happen in um, the, the lower parts of the watershed. It happens all across the watershed. So um, what's predicted to happen in the James River uh, watershed? So we're predicted to have fewer days of rain, but when we have rain, it's gonna be a lot more intense and that's gonna result in us having more rain overall. Um, so if you look at this, this chart over here, this is the what average wettest day um, of the year between 1961 and 1990, and then 1991 and 2020. And um, so you can see everywhere except for Roanoke, and I'm not really counting mathematics because 0.02 inches isn't really that big of a difference. It's probably within the margin of error. Um, everywhere else is, is showing that the wettest day is getting wetter. Um, so that's, things are going to get more intense. So if you, if um, you all think back to like last week and we had a lot of rain and every single day we had rain, we had a flash flood warning, um, at least in, in Richmond and I think a lot of the surrounding areas. And so um, when we have these rain days, we're going to have a lot more rain coming down at one time. Um, so in, in general, the intensity or how much rain comes down at a time is expected to increase between 5 and 35%. So what does that mean? Um, so across the state, basically in 2020, we, 45 counties, um, the Richmond Times Dispatch put out this great report um, last year about the hottest days and the wettest days and how 2020 was the hottest and wettest day, uh, wettest year on record. But um, you can see across the state, so it's been really, it was the, the hottest, uh, the wettest year for 45 different counties. One point that I want to kind of pull out is Appomattox County was the most anonymously wet county. So it wasn't the wettest county, but it was the most unusually wet county. And again, that's in our watershed. This is going to have impacts on not just 
people's houses and flooding, but it's also going to have impacts on things like crops and agriculture um, and things. And so we're going to talk a little bit about CSOs. So um, what we have two different CSOs in the um, in the watershed. We have one in Richmond and one in Lynchburg. And what happens is that I'm going to play this again. Um, during dry weather, what our sewer system and our sewage system is connected. And so most of the time, the water treatment plants can handle the amount of water that's going into the sewer system. But what happens when it rains is that you get the rain from roofs, you get the rain off of the roads, you get rain um, that's coming in as well as with the sewer. And so you end up getting sewage going into the river. Um, so this can look like this uh, CSL that we had in Gillies Creek up in the corner, um, or it can can look like something different. Um, if you've ever been like walking through the woods and smelled that, it could be that we've had like a recent CSL. Um, so one of the things that um, that means is that our infrastructure for moving stormwater around. So this is in places that's not just CSO, but it's also in places where they they have separate pipes. But the infrastructure for moving all of that water around during these rain events is designed for a precipitation scheme that doesn't exist anymore. So um, engineers use these things called intensity, duration, and frequency curves. And so this is just an example idea, and they call them IDF curves. This is just an example of what it is. So the intensity is how many inches per hour, how many millimeters per hour. The duration is how long does the storm last? And then this frequency is what they call like a hundred year storm, a five year storm, a 10 year storm. And they have engineering guidelines where they have to rate culverts, bridges, roads to these different um, storms. And so what has happened really is that we're under the, the design requirements that we're designing underneath are for the old precipitation regime. And going forwards, the, we're gonna have more precipitation. So all of our old infrastructure is gonna have to be updated to be able to handle a two-year storm in the new regime, which could be could look like a five-year storm in the old regime. Um, so Virginia has made some steps already to, to doing this. All of these are um, based off of old projections, and they've started to work on getting new projections. Um, they've also updated, VDOT has updated their bridge rating so that they're gonna rate design all of their bridges to 25% more water coming through. So Virginia is making steps on these things, but these are all things that are going to impact your everyday life and, and how you can, you know, get to the store when it's raining or how you can get to the hospital if it's raining or, um, you know, get to church or anything like that, how you can travel around on what, how long it's going to take the rain to leave after a storm, things like that. Um, the other impacts that we see, so 2020 um, was one of the, the wettest years that we've had on, on record. And in Richmond in particular, Richmond reached the minor flood stage, which is 12 feet on the uh, Richmond West Ham gauge, 11 times, which is the most times that we've ever reached in one year um, in sort of modern records. So this happens to be from one of the um, from the November thirteenth storm that we had, which is kind of, which is one of the highest that we've had in a very long time. Um, so this is this is the river being flooded. Um, but what's really kind of important to remember is that it's not just the roads that get flooded, but we have a lot of industry and infrastructure along the rivers. And so in the James River tidal area, so from Richmond basically down to Hampton Roads. Um, there's 234 facilities that have toxic and hazardous substances that are, are located in sort of really socially vulnerable tracks that are likely to be flooded if we have one foot of sea level rise. And that's compounded when you think about precipitation, because if you have sea level rise and then you have a big storm on top of that, even if you don't have storm surge blowing water in, 
you're gonna have all of the rain coming down. And so combined on those two things, you're gonna have these, these highly um, risky areas that are in these floodplains. And that's only from downriver. If you think about all of the industry that, that the James has from you know, Richmond up to Lynchburg and, and Buchanan and beyond, we have a lot of industry along the river and there's a lot of these, these industry places that will have toxic and hazardous substances on site. So we've produced a report a few years ago about some of these um, toxic and hazardous places. There's just things to think about is when things are gonna flood, what happens? So ways that this might show up in the state of the James. So um, in 20, the 2019 state of the James report, we had a decrease in oyster population because I mentioned earlier when we were talking about sea level rise. So more sea level rise equals more area of high salinity. But if we have a lot of fresh water coming down, that can move the, the location of the freshwater saltwater interface. And so that's what happened in 2018 is it, it pushed it down and we got all of these freshettes that killed off a lot of oysters because it became too fresh. So all of these, these factors, the heat, the precipitation and sea level rise, they're all gonna interact in ways that make it even more complicated. Um, migratory fish could possibly see benefits. So Jamie talked about how the temperature is a, a major cue for them. Well, flow is a major cue as well. And so if we see high flows, we could have um, really good recruitment years because fish are, the migratory fish are gonna be able to get up to areas that they might not have been able to get up to before. Um, we've seen you know, herring in Gillies Creek after really, really big rainstorms, but in Gillies Creek, it's a very concreted creek and there's like this much water going through it most of the time. And you wouldn't be able to have herring in that, that area, except if we had a lot of rain going on. And so things like that could actually help the migratory fish. Um, nutrient reduction, sediment and sediment reductions, as we have more runoff coming, um, coming from land, that's where a lot of the nutrients are being put into the river. That's where they're coming from. And so the, the nutrient and sediment reduction, the reductions themselves and the effort that we're putting in may or may not match up with how much extra is coming in because of the storms. So that's kind of a questionable one. It's gonna be harder to achieve the same reductions if we have more nutrients coming in. And that's the same thing that happens with bacteria. If you've been following our River Watch program at all, which is our bacteria testing program that we do during the summer, we always caution people, um, don't go in the water 24 hours after it rains. And when we do testing 24 hours after it rains, we get much higher results than we do when it hasn't rained before. So we're estimating that we're gonna see a lot more bacteria contamination as well with, with higher levels of rain. Um, underwater grasses are sort of probably gonna be impacted as well. As we see more sediment coming into the water you're not gonna get as much light through, so it's gonna be harder for these underwater grasses to grow. So this is kind of a mixture of, of what we may or may not see with the report, but remember, all of these things are compounding upon each other and interacting in ways that are extremely complicated and as well as really nuanced. So when we're talking about precipitation, does that mean every year we're gonna have record precipitation? No, what we're gonna have is overall more precipitation, but we're still gonna have within that more precipitation, wet years and dry years. So things like drought, we still are gonna have to be concerned about. Um, and it's not just, we're gonna have so much rain, we don't need to worry about drought, about water withdrawals or anything like that. We're gonna see these, these regular changes, but what's happening is that the baselines are shifting. So we're still gonna have wet years, we're still gonna have dry years, but the wetter years are gonna be wetter and probably the drier years are gonna be drier as well. So we've talked a lot and said that a lot of things are gonna be harder, but I don't wanna leave you all with this doom and gloom sort of feeling because we actually are making progress. So overall, I saw this and it was just like really inspiring to me. Overall, if we were not doing anything to combat climate change, we went on business as usual, which is kind of what it feels like sometimes we're doing. We would be in this giant red block here. But 
with our current policies and actually what we're doing, we're what we're doing, this isn't even what we've pledged to do or anything like that. We're actually in this orange section here. So we have made progress and we are doing things and things are positive and we can make a difference and we can make changes. And so if we can do something like all of the pledges that have been currently made by the, the countries across the world and, and you know, Virginia is a part of that. We've joined the um, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative to try to cut emissions. So we can have all of the people and companies that have said, we're going to cut our emissions to here. We'll be at this blue line, but we can still do more to get down to these lower levels. So I don't want to leave you all feeling like it's all doom and gloom because we're actually making a big difference. Nice job, Aaron. So keeping the positive vibes, you know, we need to think now about how do we really face this challenge? And it's an enormous challenge, but there's been so much um, study done on it. There's been um, some really um, unique and, and impressive policies that have been put in place in recent years in Virginia specifically. And so there's, some, there's a lot of good reasons to, to be um, optimistic about our future. And you know, sometimes called the, the three major pillars of, um, of addressing climate change, we want to mitigate it, we want to adapt, and we want to sustainably develop um, you know, our cities, our societies um, to be more resilient. And um, there's a lot of really incredible work that's happening right now. Um, the Chesapeake Bay Program is um, a branch of the Environmental Protection Agency that really does some of the premier science um, in the world and is really dedicated to the Chesapeake Bay watershed and making sure that we have the modeling, the science, the, the monitoring networks really understand what's happening in the Bay. And um, as part of the, the, the uh, Chesapeake Bay program and, and all the Bay states that um, are working to reduce pollution loads to the Bay, um, there is something called the Chesapeake Bay Agreement and there is a climate resiliency um, goal that's been set there. And that really includes focusing on more practices like living shorelines. So rather than having um, your riprap to protect your know, eroding shoreline, let's, let's use plants, let's use nature-like protection of our shorelines, which in turn um, provide benefits to the ecosystem, to water quality. They also provide a corridor for more inland migration as sea level rises. Um, restoring wetlands, restoring oyster reefs, um, tree canopy in our urban communities, and in our deforested portions of the um, watershed are really critical to, again, buffering that heat effect and providing really important water quality benefits. And then looking again at um, resiliency on the local level, stormwater management, um, sea level rise is presenting some serious challenges for our coastal cities like Virginia Beach, Norfolk, who are um, having stormwater infrastructure that's overwhelmed by water already, and it needs to be rebuilt and, and built differently. Those are, those are major challenges, but we're seeing some of those, those things um, already be, being put into place. And um, there's really a lot of reason to be positive. One other thing that I'll note is um, the Chesapeake Bay cleanup plan, sometimes called the, the blueprint or the, the Bay total maximum daily load, um, whatever you call it, it's all about reducing pollution to the Bay. And again, from all of the Chesapeake Bay states, Virginia um, went ahead and worked um, additional nutrient reductions, nitrogen, and phosphorus reductions into its cleanup plan um, a few years ago um, to account for climate change and the expected um, increased runoff that we were we knew would, would happen as a result of climate change. And that's just by 2025. So right now, Virginia is already in a position where we are planning to make additional nutrient reductions through wastewater plant upgrades, through good farming practices, through green infrastructure and upgrades to our stormwater infrastructure. Um, we're already on a path to, to move towards greater reductions to address greater loads from climate change. But what we do beyond that is going to be really important. And a lot of what we've covered tonight in our presentation is sort of what happens next beyond that horizon. You know, the, those long-term effects that we can start to, to um, predict um, as we see these shifts in the ecosystem. And, and we're going to have, also have to shift as, our, as a society in the, in the Bay Watershed. Um, next slide. So I have a simple message now that we've thrown all of this complex information at you. What can you do? You know, you, there's got, you've, hopefully you're feeling the urge to really get involved now. And the James River Association has so much going on in terms of improving water quality, 
and improving resilience. Um, in many, many cases, those two goals go hand in hand. And this is a classic example. Um, again, uh, uh, calling out Amber Ellis, our uh, senior watershed restoration manager. She is leading a, a, a program called the Riparian Buffer Initiative um, in the Middle James Watershed. And we've teamed up with the Department of Forestry and a number of other partners to, to do nothing but focus on planting trees and um, creating these forested buffers where they're really needed. And doesn't that look like a world of difference? So that's sort of like our idealized um, you know, stream with a healthy, um, help some healthy uh, sedges and, and um, emergent wetland plants along the banks, as well as some, um, some nice trees along there. That's gonna shade the creek. It's gonna keep it nice and cool and create some interesting habitat for different species. And it's gonna keep that water um, as clean as possible by absorbing runoff. And we have tons of opportunities for, for volunteers to come out and actually plant trees and to do much more. Um, next slide. I, I really hope you will go and check out our, our website because in addition to the, the uh, riparian buffer initiative, we, we have volunteer initiatives to plant um, um, uh, living shorelines and to do, do work involved in installing living shorelines. We have cost share programs. If you own waterfront property and you're looking to do something like that, we have tools to help you either with technical assistance or with um, funding to actually help cover the cost of some of those projects. And we, of course, would love everyone to be a member of the James River Association if you are not already. Um, but there's many other things you can do. You can be a volunteer river rat. So monitoring pollution, reporting those things to us. Um, you can be a river rep. Um, you can write to your legislator. You can have uh, meetings with our elected officials to help to kind of carry our message forward, making sure we're investing in um, sound policies to really meet the challenge of, of climate change in Virginia. And if you'd like to garden, there's, there's lots of tools we provide to help you um, make your backyard more resilient and more absorbent for stormwater. I tell you, I've got a rain barrel in my backyard, and, um, and my wife keeps telling me to stop planting trees, but it's making it, um, it's making it very absorbent. And um, that's really helpful in an urban environment like Richmond. If everybody is taking a step to really um, uh, make the, their backyards act more like sponges, it can make a big difference um, in helping the river. Next slide. So I think that's all we've got, folks. I really appreciate your willingness to, to stick with us um, to the end. One last thing I will note, this is the second out of a three-part series. Our next um, uh, webinar will be advertised very soon. That'll be late September. And our topic there is gonna be American Shad. Um, a quick flashback, in 2019, American Shad was the lowest scoring indicator in our State of the James report. In September, we're going to tell you how it's doing now. I'm going to leave you there in suspense. I'm not going to tell you yet, but it, we're going to reveal how SHAD are doing and some of the really key issues um, that we are, as an organization, um, going to be raising to, to help American SHAD going forward. So I hope you'll join us and, and follow us um, on social media and on our website to, to sign up for that next segment of the webinar series.